Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patron, Alan C. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. Not gonna lie, having this slide at Giga Berlin is one, pretty awesome, but two, probably not a bad way to start the workday. Get your endorphins flowing a little bit as you head into work. I like it a lot. I'm not going to play any clips for you. I just wanted to share this video. The full thing will be linked below. If you haven't already been binge watching FSD 11 videos, this would be a good one to check out with a variety of interactions. Listen to his overall feedback on V11 though, because personally I agree from all of the clips that I've been watching. And it feels like Tesla really did take their time to release something special here. Version 11 feels polished and has truly reignited my excitement about the full self-driving beta. And although you'll see some instances where it is far from perfect, I think you'll agree that the improvement is undeniable. And with this being the first version that has a single stack to rule them all, it makes me really excited about what the future holds. Tesla has submitted a new application to start expanding Giga Berlin. This will be the first of many. We're being told this specific application is to take production capacity from 500,000 currently up to 1 million units per year. But you have to remember that the current factory is only around 200,000 units per year, roughly. Most recently, they were at about 4,000 units per week, 16,000 per month times 12, roughly 192,000 per year run rate right now. This application is primarily for changes to the existing plant. Then it says the production facilities required for this are to be built on the existing factory premises. So sounds like it would be in the current building structure, but things getting lost in translation, I could see a way where they're talking about the existing factory premises, meaning just the land that they already have currently at Giga Berlin. You may recall that drone video we shared at the end of yesterday's video. Tesla has optimized the production processes in such a way that the amounts of fresh water previously used as a basis and contractually agreed upon are also sufficient for this expansion. So it sounds like water issues should not be a problem for this expansion. It sounds like we're still at 10,000 employees right now at Giga Berlin when the phase one goal is actually 12,000. It's important to note the expansion plans we just talked about are different than the ones we've been talking about for the past few months, specifically the other ones where they're talking about a new logistics center, including a new train station. We don't get much more on exactly what this new application for expansion will cover, but this could be Tesla reapplying for the expansion of the factory itself. For what it's worth, most of the articles I'm reading about this are saying the same thing. This primarily concerns changes to the existing plant to further ramp up production. In case you saw this article about Tesla's Cato Road 4680 pilot facility undergoing improvements, just know that this will constantly be undergoing improvements and changes. Think of the pilot line at Cato Road like a test bed where they're going to constantly try new 4680 manufacturing techniques, machines, and processes. So literally, this will constantly be going on in the background, whether it's being reported on or not. This time around specifically, we get new hydraulic power units, two new post lifts, and a newly expanded bed plate, if you're interested. Esther put out a new video of the V4 site, which we've seen a lot lately. I just wanna highlight a few things. Notice how there's a slight offset of these new V4 stalls to the right of each space, when most of Tesla's older supercharging stalls were actually splitting each parking spot, as you can see in this picture. Here's another one right on the line, and here's one more for you. Here's a good clip of the new cable length and setup. Hi. Connector. And here goes the cable under the charger. All the way up there. Shout out to somebody in the comments yesterday for pointing this out, but it looks like the V4 cable is going to be in the neighborhood of nine and a half feet while the V3 cable for comparison was just under six and a half feet. So roughly three feet longer with version four. Keep this image right here in mind. A Reddit user drew this killer diagram showing us the new V4 stalls that again, remember, are slightly offset to the right in the stall compared to version three where they lined up right on the dividing lines for each spot. This also gives us a good understanding of how the cable is actually going to work for Tesla vehicles that back in and most other CCS vehicles that will pull in going forward where the cable will be connected like this. Here we have an early V4 test from Electric Felix. Anyone can do it, right? It is just a matter of plugging in. 
And look at how long that cable is for this vehicle. Let's see what we get. I tried to preheat for at least 15 minutes. Alrighty, it's working. He pulled up with around 30% state of charge, preheating for around 15 minutes. The highest kilowatt number I saw was up to 160. Of course, this varies depending on what model Tesla you have, but I'm expecting rates closer to V3 stalls, at least for now. I need you guys to know this. My acceptance rate of sponsors is less than 5%. So for every 100 companies offering me something, I actually work with less than five. So when I say things like shout out to Vessi for sponsoring this video, at least in my eyes, there's a really good reason I'm doing so. And in the case of Vessi for today, it's really simple. I just honestly enjoy their shoes and I think they're high quality products. And yes, they are 100% waterproof, but more than that, they're super comfortable. They're easy to take on and off, they're lightweight, and most importantly, they have models with wider toe boxes to ensure that my toes have room to move around and function as intended. And I I know that everybody fears being marketed to in this day and age and for good reason. But check it out, I put these Vessis to the test of their waterproof claims and they are not lying. The paper towel stayed bone dry after being fully submerged in water. And these really are my run around everywhere shoes, going for walks with Ashley, to the grocery store, going to a friend's house, etc. Of course, styling is very personal, but I happen to think these look pretty fly. Although for me, that is now secondary to performance and comfort at the age of 33. Vessi is offering electrified viewers 15% off your entire order if you use my link in the description below or you head to vessi.com electrified. Thank you in advance to anyone supporting the channel in this way. Enjoy. Here we get a behind the scenes look at Tesla PSUs, which are fully assembled supercharger sites. They come with stalls mounted on a concrete slab and the electrical components prepared for grid connectivity. This helps Tesla get new sites up and running much faster, enabling construction to be done in a few days, not weeks. More than half of Tesla's 40,000 global superchargers were made by the 2000 person team in Buffalo. Giga New York is also making the next generation of Tesla superchargers and semi-chargers as well. This right here is pure speculation from a Chris Zhang tweet. I'm only sharing it in case some of you are on the fence about what you may buy. Maybe wait a few days or a few weeks if you have the time and see if anything develops here. This right here is the tweet. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can pause the screen if you want. According to the Tesla source code, it looks like Tesla is adding a native charge on excess solar functionality with the power wall. Plug in your vehicle at home during the day to charge using excess clean energy generated by your solar system. This is not yet live in the app. Before we would dive into the specifics on how something like this could be really beneficial for any homes that don't have great net energy metering rates and things of that nature, I'd like to see how this is actually implemented more than just the source code, so we'll wait for a little bit. You guys know I'm not really a fan of JD Power, whether they put Tesla in a good light or a bad one, but just passing along the data, we get the 2023 EV home charging study. Tesla far and away in first place, 790 points on a scale of 1000. Second place down at 757, something called a Grizzle E. Bringing up the bottom of the list, we have Chevrolet, Electrify America, and Ford. They polled over 13,800 owners of model years 2017 to 2023, BEVs and plugins. Study was done from December of last year to February of this year. One interesting tidbit, more than one third of owners say they always schedule a time to charge their vehicle, while about 50% don't use any scheduling. I will have this below if you'd like to check it out. The Model S and X round steering wheel retrofit for $700 is now officially available. This is only for vehicles that were purchased with a yoke. So you can't have a car with a round steering wheel and get a yoke retrofitted. It's only to go from a current yoke back to a round wheel. I would just point out one thing. When you have a yoke, at least if your hand is on the wheel, most of the time it's going to be right around the area where the turn signals are located. Whereas going back to the round wheel, if you have one hand on it up here, to actually signal for a turn, it's going to be a bit more cumbersome. But hey, I definitely don't think the stocks will be coming back to the Model S or X, so everybody's just going to have to adapt, and it's nice to at least have the option for those that want it. Here we have data from Jado going over January registrations for 27 different countries in Europe, so this is not just one area, 
but we have the Model Y far and away the number one best registered BEV, over 7,100. Second place was only 4,200. The ID4 and the ID3 both coming in around the mid 3,000s. I don't wanna be a plug-in hater necessarily, but I do like to see that the Volvo XC40 plug-in hybrid is down 17% year over year, while the Volvo XC40 full BEV is up 172% year over year. Zooming out to the entire auto market for the month of January, Tesla is still a small fish in this pond. VW still leading the way for January, just under 100,000 vehicle registrations. So yes, it'll be fun to watch Tesla climb up this list over time. Shifting to United States registration data, we have Tesla far and away in the number one spot in the luxury space with 49,917 new registrations. Second place was BMW all the way down at 31,000. This means Tesla had more registrations in January than the number three and number four, Mercedes-Benz and Lexus combined, including vehicles of all powertrains. Tesla is still doing this with only four models and Tesla had 57% of the EV market in January compared to BMW at 2.9% and Mercedes at 2.4%. Here's the real reason why I'm sharing that though. So I know some people in the Tesla community are very friendly with Drew Dixon saying that he has really good takes and he's somebody we should listen to. Respectfully, I probably disagree because of quotes like this. While it's extremely impressive Tesla's in the conversation today, in Drew's opinion, by the time the EV migration sorts itself out, by 2035, Mercedes will still be ahead of Tesla in terms of production. And then he adds the automaking part of Tesla will be worth less than that of Mercedes by then. You can bet your bottom dollar this has been added to the prediction tracker. So as always, let's support my thesis with some facts. And guys, please, if I ever start making arguments out of emotional, please call me out and stop me in my tracks because personally, I hate when other people do that. I'm not saying Drew did, I'm just saying in general. Anyway, Mercedes delivered 2.05 million passenger cars in 2022. Sure, it's not exactly production, but it's a good enough proxy. Tesla in 2022 produced 1.369 million vehicles. If you multiply that by 1.5, implying a 50% growth rate, that would be right around 2 million vehicles that Tesla could produce in 2023 which would be right on par with what Mercedes produced last year. And I'm expecting Mercedes maybe to stay flat, maybe they'll grow a little bit, maybe they'll decrease this year. Thus, my expectations for 2023 this year are Tesla to be very close to the production level of Mercedes. If you say, hey Dylan, maybe 2022 was an anomaly, I would say, well, going back to the three years prior to that, Mercedes did what, 2.3 million, 2 million, 1.9 million. They've been on a pretty steady downward trend, minus 2022 going up slightly. Most of us are familiar with Tesla's stated goal to produce 20 million cars per year by 2030. Now, in fairness, personally, I don't think they'll hit this number for many reasons, autonomy being one of them, but I will say that even if they do half of that, that's 10 million cars per year, and even if that's by 2035, I don't see Mercedes going into this mass market place. And even if Mercedes decided to step out of the niche luxury market space, I still don't think they would be able to compete with Tesla from a mass manufacturing standpoint. <laughs> so look, I don't wanna belabor this point anymore, but honestly, I mean, is there an argument here that I'm missing from Drew or why so many people in the Tesla community think this guy is like a great Tesla bear to listen to? Cause I'm personally not seeing it. I've read plenty of Drew's other stuff, but if I'm being honest, seeing a take like this by itself, has me putting up some red flags and wondering what's going on here. We touched on this a bit yesterday, but I just wanted to show you the picture if you haven't yet seen it. This is the new ID2 all for VW's mass market vehicle, supposed to cost around $25,000, set to debut, hit the market in the next two to three years. If I'm being honest though, I'm having a hard time buying into all of the cars that are being announced and unveiled by all of these companies. For me, when you're making a production version and you have it available for sale, then we can actually talk about it more in depth. Just so we're all clear, this really should not be news. Back in the summer of 2021, VW was talking back then about an entry-level vehicle built on the MEB or the MEB Plus platform. 
Then they said it was gonna be 2024. Now they're saying it's gonna be 2026. And what's going to underpin this ID2 all car? Well, we don't know much about it. All we get is they're going to use a prismatic unified cell they've been talking about for years. This is supposed to be used in 80% of all VW group models and it can use different cell chemistries. But as far as I can tell, there's not a ton of automakers focusing on prismatic cells. This unified prismatic cell is supposed to be in partnership with a Chinese company, Goshen High Tech, so it's not like this is proprietary to VW specifically. Don't forget, if you'd like waterproof shoes that make you feel like you're floating, be sure to check out Vessi, take advantage of that discount. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLoomis22. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did, and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.